My name is Dean Getty, and I uh, a small company called Autopilot LLC. A few months ago, and my background is I've been flying RC planes since the late 70s when I was a little kid. My uncle got me into it. I think when the prop ship came out in 2006, and uh, I realized all the things that could be done with that. Uh, like, for example, a uh, data logging to a memory card, and then the data mining what to do with that. Uh, I developed this autopilot called the Autopilot, and it's really a heavily data based development where I can do lots of flights and uh, record a lot of data, do post analysis, model data, try to implement new things. And because of the prop chips, you know, multi-threading capability, it's really allowed the development to go very fast. <coughs> this is a comparison of uh, what, what's out there right now for commercial autopilots. Uh, a few of them, the small ones. You have, uh, for example, the Kestrel. Uh, generally, these all cost six to, you know, three, six, eight, ten thousand dollars. And I think I've realized now the reason is because development is so tough. It takes a lot of engineers, a lot of work to do this in single processors. I think that's a lot of the reason why I've had so much success as a single person. Um, they're all, you know, basically half a gram, one gram, kind of weight, a couple inches on the side, and uh, this is as much information as I know about their processing power. And so the Kestrel, it's a, it's a pretty successful uh, autopilot. They use an 8-bit processor running 400 megahertz, and then the uh, Micropilot 2128, um, they've, they've upgraded to 150 MIPS processor at 32 bits. I think that's the processor buried there. And then you have the UNAV V3500, and it's not necessarily as small as these guys. And they're using some kind of PIC-16. Uh, again, I'm not really an expert on these other processors, but 40 MIPS and 16 bits. So in a sense, with the propeller chip, it's kind of easy pickings to compete with these guys. Now, the latest IMU Autopilot, I don't have a picture of them. I'm expecting some circuit boards to come in this week. Um, but what we've got with the Autopilot is um, the board weight, minus GPS, 12 grams, 2 by 1.2, so much smaller than the other guys. And you know, we all know the propeller's 160 MIPS, 8 cores, 32 bits. And uh, I'll just point to a couple things I'm doing that the other guys don't or can't do. Um, I'm doing onboard data logging to micro SD of 75 parameters at five times a second. So it's a complete black box data record of everything in the flight. Given all the processing power of the propeller, I'm also doing some fancy things like uh, as an aircraft flies faster, the control surfaces become more responsive. So to keep an airplane tuned and stabilization across the entire flight range from slow to fast, we need to actually scale back the PID gains for your attitude control. So I do that automatic and continuous uh, based on airspeed. And the other autopilots do that, but not uh, not automatic. You have to set up different ranges. It's much more user defined. Um, and then we have all the other fancy stuff going on. We have uh, vector navigation. I'll show some simple stuff on there. Um, I have over 100 user defined parameters. So the autopilot can be set up for basically any, any aircraft from eight ounce aircraft up to uh, uh, one customer I'm working with now, they have a 600 pound UAV, it's a big military UAV. So here's an example of what I can do with uh, vector navigation. This is a vector field plot. You can consider this is you know, XY, this is longitude and latitude. And the direction of the arrow shows the target heading to achieve a certain goal. In this case, this is a loiter circle navigation, and it's centered about a certain coordinate. Uh, you can see graphically what it's supposed to do. If the aircraft's here, the target heading is, you know, directly at the circle. If you get within some distance, then it starts merging onto the circle. And if you're inside, it's uh, some shade of gray between directly away from the center and merging onto the circle. And you see the, the real world results are pretty pretty accurate. These are two separate flights, two different motor radii, and a small 16-ounce uh, micro air vehicle. Here's the second navigation method vector I use. This is for path holding. Uh, a lot of times, if you've got a long path, the UAV needs to fly down. Uh, what people do in other autopilots is they'll put a bunch of waypoint targets down the line to make sure the aircraft stays on the line. There's 100 waypoints in the autopilot, not to burn through all those and use them up just to stay on the path. I come up with a vector navigation method for line holding, and this is a target waypoint. Back here would be another waypoint not shown. And depending where you are, uh, there, these arrows again show the heading vector. If you're inside this cone, then the target heading will cause you to veer towards the line at a certain user-defined angle. Here's a close-up showing that. If you start getting within a certain defined distance that the user can define, uh, you start merging onto the line. If you're outside the cone, let's say you got blown away, of course, then the target heading takes you right to the waypoint. There's no point in merging at this angle because you're going to overshoot the waypoint and then come back. It's kind of silly. So here's an example of a log data file, and the aircraft was started here, and this is when I pass control. And you can see the merge at 30 degree to the path, and then we followed by the car. And the entire time it stayed within five meters of the of the uh, path. Then we hit this uh, waypoint here, and I had it loitered for two minutes while I turned the car around and watched it. And then at uh, some point here, it uh, 
timed out two minutes, 120 seconds, and turned back around, merged, slightly overshot, got back on the line. And uh, so basically, we're talking five meter, that's within GPS resolution, more or less. So this is an example of what's in the log file. This is just a few of the columns. I have 75 columns wide. And you have data coming in at five times a second. Um, everything in terms of the GPS coordinates, the claims at, the flight mode, raw barometric pressure, uh, barometric climb rate, uh, ground speed, there's airspeed over here further, there's bias corrected pitch and roll, we have uh, altitude error, uh, there's also pitch and roll targets and error, so you can also look at the stabilization tuning. And there's also failsafe based on power, so this is a power sensor I came up with. Uh, it's, it's got a range of uh, voltage and current over what's required generally for aircraft. This data is a plot from this uh, eight ounce micro air vehicle. You may not have a laptop in the field to reprogram the flights. What I've done here is there's a way to mark the waypoint path as a relative template. So that wherever you happen to boot up, uh, it'll, it'll remap the coordinates to that current location. And uh, it also handles uh, longitude compression and decompression. So if you had a waypoint path drawn for the equator and you fly it in northern Canada, it'll look the same, same way. Uh, the autopilot is able to do different ways of triggering photos. One way is to do time-based uh, trigger intervals. As you're flying, you can trigger a photo every 10 seconds. It could be something you set up in the flight plan. But realistically, with real world wind and this and that, if you do time base, you're gonna have different photo spacing going one way versus another. So you can set up to do triggered photos every distance interval on the ground. So here, this is done with photos triggered every 200 meters ground distance. Therefore, you get a pretty uh, even spacing. Now, I've got another method where you can, you can set it up so that the uh, aircraft will actually shut the motor off a couple seconds. You can define how long, but shut the motor off before the photo's taken. So even a well-balanced propeller, you can still get uh, vibration. So this way, the aircraft will shut the motor off, it'll do a flat glide, it holds level pitch, and optionally, you can also hold roll level. Oftentimes, though, if you do that, the aircraft will get blown off course. Uh, in this case, I just had the motor shut off, it does a flat glide, holds the pitch level, takes a photo after the motor spins down, and it's very clear. Seven megapixel, if you zoom in, you can see all kinds of detail. And uh, an example, you can do log data. Right? With 75 parameters, you can kind of dream up, I wonder you know, if this depends on that parameter. It would be very awesome, say, Here's a barometric pressure versus GPS altitude. I want to see what the linear relationship is. And here is ground heading versus airspeed. You can see that uh, air, uh, this sorry, ground speed, this airspeed is constant at, uh, what is that, 60 kilometers an hour roughly. As you're going you know, against the wind, your ground speed is slower and faster. Let me give you an example here of some of the high wind I fly in sometimes. This is in Ocotillo, California. You can hear that the noise. It's so windy, we're able to land this flying wing coming straight down. <laughs> <laughs> this is an assisted flight mode for landing, and I'll show you the takeoff, how windy it was. So windy, I powered the motor up full power, the plane's still going back in my hand, and you see the bushes. We, we measured up to 50 miles an hour on the ground wind. Time just goes straight up. <laughs> <laughs> and then we pass over to autonomous and have it fly a one kilometer square grid. Once you get locked and you set the motor autonomous, it will uh, hold the wings level and take off till it gets to predefined altitude. This is not me flying RC, I just throw the airplane when it go. Once it gets to altitude, then you, it starts turning and navigating. So it hit one waypoint, did a little wiggle right there, and it's gonna start turning to the next waypoint. And it's climbing out at a 20 degree angle, 90 kilometers an hour, by the airspeed uh, PID loop for throttle. Now if you watch this over and over, you can see the takeoff. Because I'm scheduling the gains of pitch and roll control based on airspeed, when the plane's first taking off, the airspeed's low, so it's using a lot of throw on the control surfaces. You can see the elevon which is going large amounts. And then as it's going faster, you see less. There's another one that's a little clearer in the video. So again, with the power of the propeller ship, not only can I do all this fancy navigation, data logging on board, I also have full duplex uh, telemetry going on. And that allows the person to retask waypoint path as you're flying. You can also even uh, change the PID gains for the attitude control in flight. So you can tune the plane during flight. Um, you can uh, actuate the triggers. The other thing it does automatically is it retrims. So I've had aircraft where I throw a camera on, the plane's completely out of trim. And when you throw it up in the air, the plane will, will, it compares basically raw pitch and roll values from the sensors to the barometric climb angle or the GPS heading and it'll retrim. It tracks the air and trims that out. You can see all three of these flights, it's kind of down that one edge of the field there. 